All right, guys, the plane is gone. Now I can start my video. Happy Easter, guys. Happy Easter from here in wintry winter wonderland. Look at this, guys. It's so bright. <laughs> I, mean, I can almost like not even look. I can't even see anything. It's called snow blindness when everything is just so bright. Like, look at that. It's just white everywhere. Just white on the trees, white on the path. Wow, guys, I can't even see you, but happy Easter anyway. Guys, he is risen. He is risen. What do you say? You need to say, he is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. That's what people say at Easter. They say, happy Easter. He is risen. And then the other person says, he is risen indeed. Or some people say has risen. He has risen. He has risen indeed. But I think most people say he is risen. The other person says he is risen indeed. The loud noise coming from that house over there. Anyway, guys, look at this winter wonderland. So happy Easter. And uh, I want to ask you guys a question. How would you define Easter? If you had to, in a few sentences, define what Easter is, how would you... Guys, I can't even see, <laughs> I can't even see you, it's so bright. I'm gonna start crying, that's how bright. It's almost like looking at the sun. I don't know if you can see it properly in my camera, but like, it's like really, really bright. I'm sure my camera doesn't really do it justice. But you can see there's no sun, right? There's no sun. I mean, it's cloudy and it's white, but it's just, I don't know, just that amount of white. It's beautiful, but it's bright. Look at that, guys. Nice tree there with all this just covered in snow. It's beautiful. Problem is I can't see you. <laughs> That's how bright it is. So, guys... How would you define Easter? Let me know down in the comments in a few sentences or more. You can take however much time you want. Give me your thoughts about Easter. How would you define it? You know, I was thinking about that this morning. And uh, I was thinking my definition of Easter would be Easter is the most significant event in the history of the world. And it's significant because it didn't just happen in the world, it happened for the world. And it didn't just happen for the world in general, it happened for you and for me. It happened for every, everybody every human being who's ever lived. That's how significant this event is. Hey guys, there's some birds in this tree. Look at that. I don't know if you can see them. Someone put a bird feeder down here. They were just eating and then now uh, they flew up to the branches. I love birds so much. I don't know if you can see them in my GoPro because the the lens it's such a wide angle lens like what I can see very closely with my eyes it's it looks far away for you right because that's just how the camera is so anyway guys that's how I would define Easter it's a sig it's the most significant event because it happened for the world one of the most popular verses or one of the most well-known Bible verses is John chapter 3 verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Can you believe it? That That's basically what, that's, that's why this is so significant because it's about God it's about love, it's about life. It's about love and life. That's why this is such a, it's such a profound 
event that happened in history, a real, real event that happened in history. We're not talking about a religious event in people's minds. We're talking about real history here. And uh, I don't know, guys, if I, it's a bit chilly out here. I might go back to my car and I want to read you some verse, some, I want to read you some things in the Bible. And the Bible is my favorite history book. How about you? What, what's your favorite history book? Smash that like button if the Bible is your favorite history book. But it, it's my favorite history book. And uh, we're talking about a history, we're talking about the death and resurrection of the king of the universe. That is what Easter is. It's the death that, that three days, right? It happened three days that were the most intense three days in the history of the world that happened almost 2000 years ago. It was in 30 AD or some, some scholars think it was maybe 33 AD. Okay. So between eight, year 30 and year 33 happened sometime in there these three days. All right. So, uh, guys, it's not actually that long ago. I was thinking, you know, my, uh, my grandmas are, uh, both my grandmas are still alive and they're in their mid nineties. And so I was thinking, you know what? My grandmas are almost a hundred years old. So if we just go back 20 grandmas ago, that's when Jesus was in Jerusalem over these, this, this period, Easter, right? That's, I mean, that's why we celebrate Easter. Guys, it's kind of cold. I, mean, I think I'm gonna, oh, maybe I'll go this way and then I'll go back the other way to my car. But uh, anyway, just wanted to take you out for an Easter walk. And then uh, when I get to my car, I'll read you some, some things from my favorite history book. But, um, you know, a lot of events have happened in history, right? I mean, history is full of events. For example, Alexander the Great. I remember in uh, year 334 BC, I think, he decided, I'm going to conquer the world. I'm just gonna go and conquer the whole world. So he, you know, he set out and he conquered the Middle East and he went all the way to India. And then uh, on his way back, he died. I think in year 323 BC, he died. Um, now, was his death, was his death a Christian event? Or was it a Muslim event? Was it a Buddhist event? All the events in his life, all the events in history, are they like religious events? No, they're just events, right? Alexander the Great died, 323 BC, it happened. Right? So in the same way, when we're talking about these events in history, the death and resurrection of Jesus, we're not talking about a Christian event. You know, a lot of people think Easter is a Christian holiday. Well, Christians celebrate it, but it's not for Christians. It's for the whole world. Okay, these, this is an event that happened. It's not a Christian event or a Buddhist event or whatever. We're talking about the death and resurrection of a man in history. And that is just, that is just astonishing. It's profound. A person rising from the dead. You know, a lot of events have happened in history that they just, they're, they're finished events. But if someone is living, if someone dies and rises from the dead, then it makes you stop and say, huh, <laughs> maybe this is, maybe this event, maybe I need to think about this event a little bit. Because people usually don't come back from the dead. So when we're talking about Jesus, we're not talking about a dead guy. We're talking about a living person alive today. Where is he? 
Well guys, let's go back and let's read some things from the history book. I'll just sit in my car. Maybe I should uh, go warm up a bit, read some passages, and then maybe do another lap. Do another lap around the neighborhood. And because uh, I'm, this might be a long video, guys. I want to do some reading from the Bible and, uh, and then just add my two cents. You know, sometimes I like to just yap away, right? I like to talk your ear off. Now, if you guys haven't seen my Christmas video that I made about three months ago, um, I will post that up here at the end of this video because that's a great video. I had a lot of fun making it. I was excited. Just like today, I'm excited to make this video. So guys, thank you so much for joining me. Um, so if you want to check out that video, that was the longest video I ever made on my channel. I think it was like three hours long or something. So go check that video out. Um, but this video, I'm just going to be talking and reading and giving my two cents. I've been thinking about some things a lot lately, and I want to share some of those things in this video. So guys, happy Easter, and I'll see you from my car. All right, guys, I'm just in my car here, going to warm up. And um, so in my Christmas video, I think I... Well, we talked about the birth of Jesus. Remember, we talked about the kingship of... My shoes are squeaky. Can you hear my shoes <laughs> on the mat? Um, yeah, so we talked about the birth of Jesus. And there's... Remember what, remember what the angel Gabriel told? Well, okay. First, remember the angel Gabriel told Mary. Remember, she, uh, Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to have a son. Right, he said some very interesting thing and things, and then um, the 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 night that Jesus was actually born, an angel appeared to the shepherds on the hills outside Bethlehem. Now, was that angel Gabriel? I don't know. I don't think the text says if that if that was the angel Gabriel or not. But uh, what did the angel say to the shepherds? That was uh, really key. I, I just have it here on my phone. So. The angel says, um, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So just notice that it's for all people. Okay, that's, that's really significant. Um, because we're not talking about a, a group of, of people. This isn't good news for, you know, it's, it's not good news for like a certain religion. It's not good news for a certain country. Guys, can you hear my voice or is my in car too loud? Maybe I'll just turn my, I'll turn my engine off so you can hear me. Okay. So countries have, have a day that's special for people in that country right? I mean, in your country, you don't celebrate Canada Day, <clears throat> right? It's not important for you. Why? You know, it's just, just for Canadians. Um, but this day, this is for all people all around the world. Like I said, this is news, not for a certain group of people. This is news for everybody. And it's good news. It's good news because, look at this, a savior savior why do you what what why do people need a savior a savior from what well the bible says savior from our sins from from our sins are you a sinner have you ever done anything bad what does sin do it kills sin leads to death right the death of the world, the death of relationships. For example, if you're married and let's say you sleep with another person, you cheat on your spouse, what's going to happen? It's going to bring the death of the relationship, right? So sin causes death and death is permanent, guys. That's the, that's the, that's the thing about death. It's permanent. When people die, they're dead. When relationships die, 
they're dead. I mean, sometimes maybe you can <laughs> let me know if your spouse cheated on you, would that be the end of the relationship or would you go to counseling and like try to somehow, I don't know, <laughs> let me know in the comments, but when things die, they die, right? Um, so that's the thing. This world is headed for death. Why? Because of sin, because of people's sin, you and me, we're sinners. Right? So we do things that cause the world to die. And we need a savior from that. And we need a savior from the wrath of God. Because what the Bible says is sin. It doesn't just, it, yes, it kills people, but it also, it makes God angry. And God is going very angry at sin very angry that everybody is doing terrible stuff in the in the world and so his wrath is going to come that's what the bible says the wrath of god is going to come and destroy the world not because he hates the world we just read he loves the world it's because he loves the world that he's going to destroy all evil on the earth Maybe we can read some verses. I've got so many guys. I took a few notes on my phone. <laughs> They're a little bit like really just disorganized. Just, uh, just wrote a few notes down. Um, maybe we can get to all different verses in the Bible that talk about the wrath of God, the, um, I don't know, God's coming judgment on the, on, on the world. But basically we need, we need a savior from death. And we need to be saved from God's wrath. Is there any way we as, as human beings can be saved from death or, or is that our, is that our destiny just to die? And you know, the worms will eat our body in the ground, or if we get cremated, we'll be burned to ashes and our ashes will get sprinkled somewhere or put into a nice little urn. <laughs> the little jar is called an urn that people put their their loved ones ashes in and then you can just sit up in the on a shelf in the house how would you like that for your ashes to just be in an urn on a shelf in someone's house you know the point is you're dead right it doesn't really matter if you're ash or if you're buried in the ground and the worms eat your body or yeah, you know, is there any good news in the world? Is there any good news or is it just death? Is that our ultimate destiny? Sin and death and no, there, there is good news. And that's what this event is all about. That happened almost 2000 years ago. That death has been defeated. And in Jesus, there is life and there is hope. There's, there's, there's a future. Right? It's all about love and life. God loves the world. He wants to, he wants people to live forever. You guys, I'm going to stop. I'm kind of, you know, I get in these phases where I just start talking and then I just keep rambling for a long time. I don't want to do that in this video. <laughs> I might, but I want to do more reading and less rambling. Okay. So, um, there's a very famous, uh, ver couple verses, um, in the Bible. Uh, I'll read them to you here and let me know. Have you ever heard these before? So this is about Jesus. This is about the death of Jesus. Why did he die? Why? What was that all about? Okay. It says, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. God laid on Jesus the sins of everybody. That's what it says. So my sin and your sin was taken from us, placed on Jesus, and he died and he put those sins to death. He, he paid the punishment that we deserved and he took it. He paid it. He was crushed. 
for our sins. Why? Why would he do that? Because of love. He loved us. You know, it's, you know, when, when you love someone, <clears throat> you, you know, you, you, you try to pay for, <laughs> you, I've done this guys. And I know you have too, you know, you, when you love someone, you try to take the, you take the burden off of them and you put it onto yourself, right? You try to, you know, maybe they do things that are, that are really damaging to the relationship, but because you love them, you try to take, you just you want to remove that from them so that it doesn't get in the way for the relationship, right? Because that, if that stays there, you know, it's, it's going to hurt the relationship. It's going to kill the relationship, right? And so you just need to try to like, because of your love, you want to take it away, right? So that's what Jesus did. He took our sins on himself and took it to the cross. He died and we could go free. That's astonishing. Um, you know, nobody, would you be willing to die for someone? Would you be willing? Do you love someone so much that you would be willing to die for them? Um, that's what the Bible says. God loved us so much. It, it, he didn't, he did he, so God's not just standing there saying, I hate you because of your sin. He made a way for us to be forgiven, right? Because of love. So we don't need to earn our way to God through good works. You know, like, oh, if I do this, maybe God will be happy with me. And I, maybe he'll save me because I did this and this and this and this. And I worked my way up to, to heaven, <laughs> right? You can't do that. You know, that's what the Bible says. You can't build your way up to heaven. You can't work. You can't work to make God, you know, like accept you by your own works. There was one person in history who was sinless. That's why, that's why he was the one to pay for, to pay for the sins of the world. You know, sometimes people ask the question, how can one man pay for the sins of the whole world? How can, how can one man pay for your sin, my sin, that person's sin, all the people's sin around the world? That's a good question. The answer is because that one man is worth more than all of them put together. He's worth more than the whole world put together. That man is the son of God. Okay. So, you know, that's an important word that people often, uh, people often overlook. Jesus is the son of God. And if you think, if you have a son, think about this. When you have a son, are you, are you one with your son? Yeah, you're one with your son, right? You want your son to be like you. Your son wants to be like you. Your son wants to please you. You know, you see those cute videos on, um, uh, online of like kids walking around in their parents' shoes, right? You might see a little girl, you know, walking around in her mom's high heels, right? Just a tiny little girl with these huge shoes, right? Tiny little feet in these huge shoes. Why? Because she's one with her mom. She wants to be with her mom, right? She wants to be like her mom. Her mom is her hero. She wants to, you know, she just wants to do everything the same. Right. If a mom is putting on makeup in the bathroom, the daughter, her daughter's there, wants to put on makeup too. Right. So he wants, there, there, there's oneness, right? So God, there's one God. That's clear in the Bible. There's one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't know if we'll get to, uh, how many verses we're going to get to guys in this video, probably until my battery dies. <laughs> <laughs> might be sitting here for a while, but, um, uh, just, a, just, a uh, just a side note about the worth. Uh, uh, I was just thinking about that. Okay. Like how can one person be worth more than another person? Well, let me ask you a question. Um, 
does is your family member worth more to you than a you know than your than your neighbor well yeah obviously right like imagine if a king um you know and we we see this in his we see this all the time in history let's take joe biden for example joe biden hey he has a son right named hunter biden now hunter biden's been in all kinds of stuff everybody knows that his son hunter biden is not the best guy but why does he get away with everything why why is why is it that hunter has not isn't in jail why isn't it that he's not in jail yet it's because his dad is the president of the united states right or let's think of another example let's say you know let's say uh a king's son gets kidnapped right and uh and also some other guy gets kidnapped now, what's the king going to do about his kidnapped son? He's going to try to get the son back, right? He's going to pay whatever the ransom is to get the... He's going to pay a million dollars, a billion dollars, whatever it is to get his son back. Will he pay that amount for the other person? No, he won't. Because he doesn't care about the other person, right? So... You know, when you love someone, you're willing to you're willing to pay the ultimate price. So value, the value of something is what someone is willing to pay for it, right? So like if, you know, let's say you want to buy some, uh, I don't know, what do I have here, a pen? Let's say I have a pen, and uh, what's the value of this pen? Well, the, it, the value depends on... Um, what you're willing to pay for it, right? It might be five cents, 10 cents. But what if you offered me a million dollars? Well, that means the value of this pen is a million dollars, right? So the value of something depends on what someone's willing to pay for it. So when we think about that verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life well that was a very very expensive thing right that cost everything that cost it was costly guys I'm a bit hot just gonna cool off a bit get some fresh air before I was cold and now I'm hot Maybe we should take another lap. Should we take another lap around the neighborhood? But uh, I just wanted to share uh, one verse, uh, what Jesus said. He said, um, I just pulled it up on my phone here. He's talking about his, his, his life. And he says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. So nobody took nobody forced Jesus to die nobody took his life from him I mean yeah they grabbed him remember when he was in the garden of Gethsemane he was betrayed by Judas his friend you know for no reason he was betrayed um, religious leaders grabbed him and they took him to the you know the the political leaders you know the Roman the Roman the Romans basically you know Pontius Pilate and uh, you know so yeah, you could say the Romans killed them. You could say it was the the religious Jews who killed them. You could say it was, you know, his friend who betrayed him to death. But ultimately, it was the heart of God to want to forgive the world and to give the world life. That's what this story is all about. That's what this message is all about. So Jesus wasn't sent to his death against his will. No, it was his own heart. Remember when he was on the cross? What did he say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was dying, you know, dead meat on a cross, facing the most brutal death, most horrific pain. Uh, you know, his hands and feet were nailed to the cross. Remember, he had the crown of thorns on his head. And um, he didn't need to be there. He did it out of love. Remember when they... Uh, grabbed him in the garden of Gethsemane. Um, remember Peter, his follower, one of his 
followers Peter, he drew his sword right and he cut off the guy's ear. Um, and then Jesus told Peter to put his sword away. And Jesus told him, he said, look, I could, I could, I could have thousands of angels here, right? If I, if I call on angels, if I ask my father to send thousands of angels, he will send thousands of angels. He had the authority, right? Jesus is the king of the universe. He has the authority over everything, but he willingly gave his life. Um, so guys, I was just thinking about the value thing, um, how, how people, how people value each other differently, um, and how this world values people. What's, you know, the value of something is, is, is can be, unfortunately in, in our world, we can, we can really treat people badly and take their value away from them. All right. So, um, let's imagine, I just wrote, I just came up with this list here. Okay. Imagine a, the perfect woman, right? 10 out of 10, a perfect woman in the world. What does she look like? What does she What's her personality like? Just think about the perfect woman, okay? Um, now let's say she is from a low-class family. Well, what the world does then, it lowers her, right? Oh, she's low-class. Well, I'll lower, lower her from a 10 to a 9, let's say. Now let's say she is poor. Let's say she's in debt. Ooh, the world says, ah, uh, you know, yeah, maybe she's good looking, but uh, she's in debt and she's poor. So they lower her from a 10 to an 8. Right now, what if that woman is divorced? Well, and she's down to 7, maybe, right? Uh, let's say she has, she's divorced and has kids. Well, uh, she's got kids, well, and she's down another notch to 6. Then let's say she has some mental health struggles. Ooh, and she's down to five. Uh, let's say she has some physical health problems. Uh, then she's down to four. What's What if she has a scar on her face? Let's say she has a scar on her face or body somewhere. Oh, and she's down to three. Now let's say she's uh, really fat. What does our world say about that? Well, then uh, there's just a guy over there walking his dog. So what if, uh, you know, if, if a woman is really fat, well, just look around in our world, you know, do fat women get the same amount of, um, do they get the same amount of attention? Do you see them on the cover of magazines and stuff like that? Not usually, right? So, um, the world, what the world says, okay, we're going to lower your value, right? Um, and so what if she's, what if she's old? Ooh, we're going to lower her value even more, right? So the, the world can be really cruel, right? Now imagine if she's old, fat, sick, has a scar and everything. Now it, she might still have the ability to work and make some money, but imagine if she's in the hospital, if she's dying, she's on her deathbed. What is her value then? What is her value? Well, according to the world, her value is zero. It's just zero. But God sees things differently. Okay. So if you are, you know, what would you rate yourself? You know, sometimes people rate each other. Uh, they'd say, oh, like that chick is 10 out of 10 or she's a seven out of 10 or like, you know, <laughs> the world is, has such superficial ways of evaluating value. Well, if someone is sick and dying, in God's eyes, are they any less valuable? They're valuable because they, they are loved by God and God died for them. Right? Jesus is God. The Son of God died to save all people all people everywhere. So that's value. So when we think about, when we think about how, why one person can die for the sins of the whole world, 
Well, because in God's eyes, Jesus, who is the author of life, he's worth because everything came from him, right? He's the, he's, he's the most important person. He's the author of life itself. That's why that man can die to pay for the sins of the world because he is the creator of all the world, right? That's why, um, you know, but it's a good question. How can one person die for the sins of another? Well, because that person is, 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 is really valuable. That person is really valuable. Like if a king's son was, let's say, kidnapped, the king might trade like a thousand people for that son, for that one son, right? That's how valuable that son is for him, right? So God wants this whole world to be a place where he can live with his people forever, have life and be with us forever. That's what he wants, but he can't do it because of sin. And so because of all the evil that's, that's going on in the world, guys, my battery's going to die. Got to start my car here. <laughs> so that's anyway, I'm rambling again, guys. Uh, <laughs> hope you don't mind my rambling, but uh, that's why, that's why there needs to be payment for sin, right? So that we can be forgiven and that we can have new life and live in God's world. It's not about us. It's about God. It's about, it's about his, it's about, it's about his world, right? So that's what this story is about. Um, and like I said, when I use the word story, it's, I'm not talking about some like fairy tale. This is history, right? Jesus died and rose again in those three days, those intense three days, um, almost 2000 years ago. So we're talking real history here, right? Guys, maybe I should go for another lap around the, uh, let's go for another lap around the neighborhood. Look at those nice geese up there, guys. And I see a bird in this bush fluttering around there. Anyway, guys, I said I was going to read and stop rambling. So I want to read you, um, I want to read you about the resurrection, because that's what Easter really is. The word Easter, when people think about Easter, like, you know, they celebrate Easter the Sunday, you know, yeah, those three days are kind of all together as Easter. But when people talk about Easter, what they're really referring to is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, from the tomb, right? So I want to read you this, uh, I'm out of breath already, I haven't even walked. 10 steps. <laughs> I'm already out of breath, guys. <clears throat> so the astonishing thing is that Jesus didn't stay dead. Okay, so I want to read you this, uh, what my history book says here. Okay, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you? While he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Guys, I can't read and walk at the same time very well. <laughs> I'm trying my best to uh, keep the path in sight while I <laughs> read like this and, and walk. <clears throat> but, uh, man, it's a nice day. There's no wind. This is great, guys. Thank you for joining me on this walk. I'll just, I'll try not to wander off the path. I'll keep reading here, okay? So when they came back to the tomb, they told all, uh, so, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven 
and to all the others. Now remember, it wasn't 12 anymore. It was 11 because Judas, who betrayed Jesus, he went and killed himself, right? So now it's 11. Jesus had 11 disciples. They're there right now. The women are coming back from the tomb. So it says, <clears throat> it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and all the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Okay, here you've, you know, you've been with this guy for years of your life, going all around, doing crazy things, seeing Jesus do incredible miracles, raise the dead, heal the, heal the sick, you know, blind people seeing, lame people walking, you know, all the kind of diseases, all the kind of like the, you know, it's just incredible. In the, in the, uh, in my Christmas video, we, I think we read a bunch of those different stories and everything. But anyway, it would just be cra crazy when you're around someone and then they die like that and you're like, now what do I do? You know, you'd be scared. You would be, you'd be so sad. You'd be like, just, it'd just be like, what do you do? <laughs> That's why they were like huddled together. All his followers were like huddled together in like a, in like a house. They didn't know what they were going to do next. They, they had no idea. Um, and, and so then let me, <clears throat> Guys, I think I need to go back into my car and warm up a bit. <laughs> uh, my uh, cold wind, cold air on my throat. <sighs> but it's actually not too bad. It's fresh. I like this weather. It's fresh, but it's just, just a little bit too cold to be walking outside. So um, let, me, let me keep reading here. Okay. So it says, while they were talking, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have... Uh, sorry guys, I can't read and walk very well. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. All right, guys. So that's from the uh, Gospel of Luke. That's the end of the Gospel of Luke. Um, there are four Gospels in the Bible. Gos the word Gospel means good news. It's like the basically the the account of Jesus's life. 
Um, so the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So just get a Bible and uh, read those. Read it, If you want to read about the resurrection, read what it says at the end of each one of those, because all of them end with that. Jesus rising from the dead, and they're just like startled, frightened, full of joy, full of like... It, it just, it's just, it, can you imagine what it would be like if someone rose from the dead? Suddenly, you, when you saw someone die and be buried, and then now they're alive and they're in your presence and showing you the hand, his, Jesus showed them his hands and feet, and, and he ate the fish. <laughs> it's like, hey guys, I'm hungry, give me something to eat. <laughs> give him a, some fish. Like, this is just the most astonishing thing ever and so I don't even know how I would re how I would re react in that situation it's just it's just incredible like they just didn't believe it it's like we can't like first they didn't believe the women right first the the 11 disciples they didn't believe the women and 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 then Jesus appears to them and what how, how can a person rise again from the dead? You know, it's astonishing, but um, that's what Easter is. That's what Easter is about. It's about the most astonishing thing that happened. So because Jesus lives, we also can live forever, right? Jesus rose again with a kind of body that we, we, do, that we can't understand. We can't, you know, we, we can't, put words to it how is it how is it that he has a body that is is not is not going to die because our whole life we live under the shadow of death right we live in the shadow of death we live with the knowledge that we have guys there's a tesla i'm gonna walk this way guys i don't want to block that good tesla owner's Oh, now the Tesla's going that way. Thought he was uh, backing into his driveway. Anyway, keep walking this way then, guys. <laughs> so what was I saying? I was rambling again. That's, that's why humans have hope. Because Jesus, who is a human, the best of humans, <laughs> the most valuable of all humans, he he is a living he's living today and we he promised that we will live too all people who trust him and who uh you know who love him we we will we will live so what's the next what's what's he where is he now what's he gonna do now well it says he went up to heaven he's ascended into heaven and it's hard for our minds to understand that right it's like a different dimension that we can't quite understand but uh Guys, I'm going to go back into my car and then I'm going to talk more and read some more stuff to warm up my hands so I can... My noggin is a bit frozen. Noggin means your brain. My brain is a bit frozen here, guys. Alright guys, I'm back in my nice warm car. <laughs> oh, there goes the Tesla. That Tesla is just driving back and forth along here, guys. I don't know what's... I guess it's not super weird. Here's me walking loops around the neighborhood. People are probably thinking, what's that guy doing holding a GoPro walking around the neighborhood? Anyway, guys, so uh, where are we in the story? He, Jesus died. He rose again. This was 2000 years ago, almost. Now, wh wh where, what, wh like, now what? Now what? What's next in the plan? What's next in God's plan? Well, Jesus is coming back, and I think very soon. Um, what did he say? Would, uh, let me read you exactly what, well, he said a lot of things about coming back, but let me just read you uh, one thing, for example. He says in uh, Matthew chapter 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. OK, 
Okay, so he's coming back to judge the world. You and me and the nations, every, every, everybody. Now, remember, um, remember when Gabriel, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary? What did he say to her? He said something very interesting. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Okay, now there's one line in there that's really interesting. He will sit on the throne. What does it say? Uh, God will give him the throne of his father David. So where was David's throne? You remember King David, which was a thousand BC, around there, a thousand years before, before Jesus? What does David's throne mean? Is David's throne in heaven? No, it's not in heaven. Is David's throne in in my heart? That's not in my heart. Where is David's throne? It's 10,000, about 10,000 kilometers that way. Let me see my bearings. Where's the sun? Yeah, about 10,000 kilometers that way, guys. In Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem. Now, did that happen? Like, was Jesus, uh, do you, you know, it, like this promise that Gabriel gave to Mary, he's going to do it. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. That hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. And I think it's going to happen very soon. If you have, remember the video I made at Frank's slide about six months ago, I'll try to post that up here at the end of this video if you haven't seen it. I talked about 7,000 years, what seems to be God's 7,000 year plan from, well, actually, I have more thoughts on, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get off onto a rabbit trail, but um, I think there were two phases of 7,000, basically. But the, but the important one for us is that there's, that there's 7,000 years between Adam and Eve and us. Here. So we're at, I think we're at six, we're at almost 6,000 years. So Jesus is going to come back very soon and reign as king from Jerusalem over the world. Now you might be thinking, that's insane. Mark, okay, this, um, a man in 30 AD or 33 AD died, rose again, went to heaven and is coming back to reign over the world from Jerusalem. You might be thinking, Mark, that is insane. It's, Mark, do you really believe it? Yeah, I do believe it. That is what's going to happen, guys. Everything the Bible is, and the, okay, the interesting thing about this history book is it's not just about history. It tells the future. And everything in it is coming true before our eyes. When I read this book, a lot of the things in the Bible are a little bit mysterious, but when you think about them for a long time and you start to understand what God's plan is, this guys, this world isn't just kind of spinning out of control in a bunch of stars and we're, you know, we're just going to go forever. And no, there's a plan. There's real things that are happening. Keep your eyes on Jerusalem. That's what I would say in this video. If you don't believe, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in Jesus, keep your eyes on Jerusalem. That's all I can say. And you will see incredible things happen in the next few years. Guys, this is happening. <laughs> I can see this shaping up. It's going to be, uh, there's going to be major fireworks going on uh, very soon in the world. Um, so it's okay if you if you don't believe me, if you don't believe the Bible, but just understand this is what the Bible says, okay? Um, this is just the most incredible book ever. So let's see, what else am I gonna read you here? Guys, I'm getting a bit hot again. Just swings from cold to hot. <laughs> Open the window and uh, probably sit here for a bit more and then we'll go for another lap around the neighborhood. So <laughs> see how many laps we can take, guys. So, um, I, so I asked a woman recently, um, I was talking to a woman recently, guys, now I felt a bit cold. Maybe I'll open that window over there. 
then it's not direct cold on me. There we go. Okay, so I, I asked a woman recently, when Jesus comes back, what do you think he's going to do with his enemies? And uh, <laughs> her answer was really funny. She said, I think he's going to tolerate them because he's a nice guy. That was her answer. So my question was, when Jesus comes back, what do you think Jesus is going to do with his enemies? Because there are enemies who hate him, who don't want him to be king, who, uh, who hate his guts and who want to kill him. Are you one of those people? Would do you do you want to kill Jesus? Um, a lot of people in the world hate the idea that this world has an owner, that this world has a, a rightful king. They want to be king of their own life. They want to do what they want to do. They want to do things that hurt people, like politicians. And the, all our politicians, they just steal from us, right? What do you think Jesus is going to do to those politicians when he comes back? Well, this woman answered, she said, I think he's going to tolerate his enemies because he's nice. A lot of people think Jesus is just kind of weak. You know, he's just kind of a nice guy and, you know, he's not going to do anything. He's never going to do anything. He's just kind of like just a nice guy that we might we celebrate his birthday sometimes right on Christmas we celebrate his birthday and then at Easter yeah we celebrate this or that we go to church and we just it's like it's like a it's like a fairy tale for people and they don't understand they don't understand the justice of God God doesn't God is not going to put up with the world forever he's not remember Noah's flood remember when the when 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 Noah was in the ark God told a man named Noah build the ark right this was a long time ago thousands of years ago he built told him build the ark get in it i'm going to flood the world i'm going to destroy everyone because everybody was wicked the whole world had turned deeply evil so he saves noah and his 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 family noah's family right the whole world is covered in water right that's why i found seashells up 10,000 feet up, right? Have you ever hiked on mountains and found seashells? I have. Right? This is real, real history. Noah's flood really happened. That's why you can climb up mountains, you know, you can be up 10,000, 20,000 feet and find seashells way up there. Okay. So God saved, God destroyed the whole world, but he told Noah what was going to happen. Right? And then remember when, um, you know, his people went down to Egypt as slaves. God told God told Abraham, look, your descendants are going to be slaves in Egypt for four centuries. And then I'm going to take them out. And then what happened? Moses, the story of Moses. Remember, he took his people out from Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. You know, God tells us what he's going to do before he does things. And so this world isn't just kind of going forever and, oh, we need to be nice and make God happy so we can go to heaven. No, this world isn't about, the purpose of this life is not about going to heaven. The purpose is what's God, what is God doing in this world? What is he doing? There's real, this is real history. So 2000 years ago, God sent his son to die for the sins of the world and he came alone as a little baby, right? Will Jesus come back again as a little baby next time? Remember they tried to kill him. Remember we read at, in the Christmas video? I remember we read the story of King Herod trying to kill Jesus. <clears throat> next time he's not going to come back that way because he said, remember he's going to come in his glory with all his angels, thousands and millions of angels and He's going to rule, he's going to reign from Jerusalem and all the people, all the leaders of this world are, are basically going to crap their pants, right? To put it, to put it, uh, <laughs> to put it crudely, they're going to, they're going to crap their pants, right? And that's why they're building bunkers. So what it says in the Bible, 
it says a couple places that all the rich people and all the kings and the politicians and everything, they're going to hide in holes in the ground because they, they, they're going to try to get away from him. They know they they can't beat him. When they see him, they know they're not going to be able to beat, beat him. And so they're going to hide in holes in the ground. Well, what do we see happening all around the world? We see rich people building bunkers in the ground just thousands and thousands of bunkers going in all the, all over the world. Um, you probably heard of Mark Zuckerberg's bunker recently in Hawaii, like multi-billion dollar bunker, I think, on the island of Kauai. So why is it that all these rich people are digging down into the ground? They know something's coming. Now, do they know that Jesus is coming? No, they don't care about him. They hate him. Um, but what they real but they recognize is the only safe place to go is in the ground when war when like nuclear war breaks out or you know space war I, I don't know they just feel like going down in the ground is is the safest place for them that's why they're building and the bible says they're all the rich people yeah they're going to be they're going to be digging holes in the ground and we see this happening right today right so guys we are nearing the end we are actually nearing the end of what what this book what the history book talks about now again you might be thinking this is insane yeah well you know what is insane when things written thousands of years ago actually come true the stuff in the bible is really happening so we need to wake up wake up smell the coffee and don't be like one of the rich leaders you're going to crap their pants when they see the king of the world in Jerusalem, right? He's coming and when he comes, it's not going to be, he's not going to tolerate his enemies and say, oh, you know, all those politicians, you nice politicians of the world, let's get along with each other. Let's make peace with each other. Oh, you want to, you want to steal your, your people's money? You want to steal all the money from those poor people? Well, I'll just tolerate that. You know, let's make peace. Let's get along. There is no peace. There is, there's not going to be any peace with evil. He is literally going to kill everybody who opposes him. There's a, um, I want to read you, <clears throat> I want to read you what it says, um, Gospel of Luke, just uh, a few chapters before what I read about the resurrection. Guys, this book is so interesting. Um, the crowd was listening to everything Jesus said. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. Okay, so this is important. People thought when Jesus came last time that he was going to just be the king of the world and he was going to set up his kingdom and, and he was going to begin to reign. That's why they were so confused when he died. They, and they were like, "What? where is the kingdom? Where? What? How is, how does this work? Okay. But that wasn't God's plan. Okay. So this is what Jesus, look at, look what he's saying. He's correcting their impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. Okay. So he's telling them this story to correct that impression. He said, a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, Invest this for me while I'm gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with the little I entrusted to you, so you will be governor of ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. 
But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then turning to the others standing nearby, the king ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But master, they said, he already has ten pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And as for these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. Ex enemies, bring them in and execute them. Some other translations um, say slaughter them, right? Bring them in and slaughter them in front of me, right? Jesus isn't a, isn't, oh, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's tolerate our enemy. Let's tolerate everybody. It's not going to be that way. People think that because they don't read the Bible. Okay. That's why reading the Bible is so important. What, who is this God? Who is coming back? Who is this King? What does he want? What is, what's he going to do when he comes back? Guys, you either are going to be saved or slaughtered. Now you only have two options. Okay. Saved or slaughtered. There, there's no middle ground. Loud truck ruining my video. Anyway, guys. Um, so what I've been thinking about a lot lately is that you will share the fate of your hero. Everyone will share the fate of their hero. Who's your hero? Who is your hero? You will share their fate. Why? Because it's right. It's right for you to share the fate of your hero. And you know, what I see in the world is people who want a hero as long as it's good for them. And then when suddenly something bad happens to their hero, they say, oh, oh no, we don't want that hero anymore. We're going to get a new hero. Can you take a new hero? Well, you might have a chance. You might have a window. When you recognize that your hero maybe doesn't love you and does not have your best interest in mind, what's the smart thing to do? Well, the smart thing is to say, okay, I'm not going to make that person my hero anymore. I'm going to find a different, I'm going to go to the real hero the real hero, right? And I'm going to say, I'm sorry for following the wrong hero. Uh, forgive me. I want to follow you. You're my hero, right? So everywhere I look, people, they have these stupid heroes, like these celebrities or whatever, who don't care about them, who don't even know them. They will still share that fate of their hero. Why? Because they're part of the hero's empire basically right they're under the they're under the hero's uh control and it's it's not it's not right for them to share a different fate like maybe to put it to, to give to give you an example like imagine imagine if my hero is a let's say a guy who eats cake all day every day right some nice chef who makes cake and just eats cake all day and uh, there's another plane ruining my video, guys. Okay, and let's say that let's say the guy, my hero, who eats cake all day and nothing else, let's say he dies of a heart attack. Well, I've been following him 
and I'm eating cake all day every day. So what should happen to me? Let me know in the comments. What do you think should happen to me? My hero ate cake all day, every day, and died from a heart attack. Now I'm eating cake all day following him. When he dies, that should probably be a wake-up call for me, right? A wake-up call saying, okay, uh, I need to actually change or turn around here because else I'm going to share the same fate as him. I'm also going to die of a heart attack. Would it be right if I kept eating cake and expected a different result? No, I would be stupid if I kept doing what he did and expected a different result. I would be stupid, right? I am going to share that fate of my hero. So this is what happens. People share the fate of their hero, but when they hear, when they see the hero, <laughs> like kind of like maybe having something bad happen to them, then they don't want to share that. They, they want to share in the hero's pleasure or the hero's fame, but they don't want to share in the fate if the fate is, if, if the fate isn't good, right? So I've been thinking about this for a while. And so with when it, the dog wants to get in on my videos, guys. So when it comes to Jesus, those who, those who follow Jesus, who that if, you know, if Jesus is your hero, you will share in his fate. Why? Because that's just what happens. That's how this world works. You share in the fate of your hero. So if your hero dies, you die. If your hero lives, you live. You know, if your hero reigns as king, you reign as king in his kingdom. That's how it works. Okay, we see this playing out all the time. Um, you know, like I said, with a little girl, let's say, who's walking around in her mom's high heels, who's she going to grow up to be? She's going to grow up to be like her mom, right? She's probably going to inherit her mom's shoes, her mom's makeup, or she's going to be, she's going to look like her mom, maybe. She's going to do the things her mom did, right? Why? Because that's right. That's, that's what happens in this world. Okay, so that's how God made the world. You, you need to share the fate in your hero, or to put it another way, you know, your actions have consequences, right? Your decisions have consequences. If you eat cake all day, you will not have a fit body. It doesn't matter how badly you want a fit body. I want to be healthy. I don't want to die of a heart attack. I want to be strong. I want to have a six pack. Keep eating your black forest cake. Guys, I love cake. <laughs> I am eating too much of these days, guys. I got to trim back a bit. But, uh, you know, d does that make sense? Does that concept make sense? Well, the death of the hero, Satan is people's hero too. People choose Satan because they want pleasure. They want a life of pleasure. They want a life of riches. They want a life of independence. Now, Satan doesn't convince people that he's real. He makes them think they're their own hero. That's how Satan works. Satan doesn't come into your life and say, I'm Satan here. You need to worship me. No, Satan says, you worship yourself. You are the hero. You do whatever you want. You get whatever you want. So that's why you see a lot of people in this world, guys, who are living for their own pleasure. They're living for their own name like Alexander the Great. He died for his own name. People live for their own pleasure. People live for their own luxury. They try to make their name great. They name their buildings after themselves, right? Like, why do you think Donald Trump named his tower Trump Tower? Why did he do it? Because he wants his own name to be great, right? And so that's how Satan convinces people to follow him, is to follow themselves, okay? So they share the fate in their hero. Now, Satan, 
Satan's fate has been sealed by Jesus. Satan is going to be burn, burning in hell forever and ever. That's what the Bible says. Okay? So, you can't follow Satan's way. You can't follow Satan's plan of, you know, pleasure and uh, success and fame and... Yeah, there's a car alarm over there. Now I'm distracted. <laughs> you can't follow Satan's plan and expect to end up in a different place. The end of that plan is hell. The end of that path is hell. Okay, so like, look at this path, right? If I follow this path, if I follow this path and at the end of the path I can see hell, what do you think the smart thing to do would be? It would be to say, I'm not following Satan anymore because his path leads to hell. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to see maybe if there is a chance that I can follow God's path if he's going to forgive me. There might still be a window open. So I go this way and I say, Jesus, I was following your enemy. Please forgive me. Uh, I'm, I want, I want to, I want, I, I like where you, I like your plan, your path. I like that end ending. I don't want to burn in hell. I want to live with you forever. Why? Because you love me and you care about me. Satan doesn't love me. Satan doesn't care about me. I don't want to go to hell forever. Right? That's what you do. You, 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 you wake up. You look at the path where it's ending. It's ending in death. And you choose a hero whose path ends in life. Now you can't choose two heroes. Right? You can't say, well, I'm going to be heroes of that person and that person and that person. No. Why? Because they're enemies of each other. Right? Imagine in it today, think about this today, if a person said, my heroes are Joe Biden, Vladimir Putin, you know, Chairman Xi Jinping, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un, um, you know, Justin Trudeau. Just gonna warm up here. <laughs> it's a bit cold out there. <sighs> Guys, I wish you could be here in my car and stay nice and warm. Maybe I should go and grab a tea. Well, I'll ramble a bit more than maybe I'll drive and grab a tea and then keep my ramblings. But um, you need to choose a side. That's the nature of reality. If you don't think you need to choose a side, it's living in a in a dream world realistically now I know for our generation it's hard to understand this because if you're if you've grown up in the Western Empire and in many parts of the world many parts of the world have have not seen war uh, for their whole life and for maybe their parents or their grandparents life like if I think about here in Canada here in Canada there has never been a war in my lifetime, in my parents' lifetime, in my grandparents' lifetime. We've had so much peace and prosperity that these people think it's just normal. This is normal life, right? Look at all these people living in nice houses, right? It's, it's, well, it's great if this would be normal, but the problem is in this world, um, there are war, wars. And, uh, and it's very possible for a civilization to be, you know, for a hundred years or a few hundred years. And then war comes and then people are like, whoa, I didn't expect this. Where did this come from? You know, so they have to be smart and they have to, you know, ultimately they're going to, they're going to face the, they're going to face the, the result of what their society has, has done. So if a society is evil, if politicians have are stealing a lot of money and everything like that, ultimately that society is going to collapse. It's going to fall, right? And all the people are going to fall with it. 
So the smart thing is to recognize, okay, which kingdom do I want to be part of? I want to be part of the winning, the winning side, right? And that's what usually happens in a war. When one side starts losing, then they say, oh, we, we, we don't want to be part of this side anymore. We want to join the other side. But is that possible at that point? Or is it too late? So in the German Empire, when the German Empire came to an end in 1945, remember when it collapsed? In the weeks and months leading up to that end, you know what the generals were doing? You know what the top generals did? They were trying to make deals with the with the enemy and say, we, we, we want to join your side now, guys. <laughs> we don't want to we don't want to fight for Hitler anymore uh, now we want to be your friend what would you say okay you get a call from one of the German generals and the German general says uh, I'm going to join your side what would you say well you you might say like look buddy you've just killed millions of our people and now you want to join our side? Don't you think it's a bit late for that? What would you say? What would you say in that situation? Why were they wanting to change sides? Because they loved Hitler. They were, they were fully on board with their own empire. Why did they want to change sides? It's because they realized, they realized that they were going to lose. That's why they changed, wanted to change sides. They didn't want to change sides because they loved the other side. They didn't want to change sides because they hated Hitler or because they hated Germany or they hated... No. They just wanted to change sides because they were losing. And this is what I mean. People always want to change sides at the end. But at the end, is there a window of opportunity to do it? Or is that window closed? Well... What do you, what's your answer if you got called by one of those uh, German generals? Well, it, 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 it depends on you, right? The decision is up to you. Let's say you're one of the generals of the allies. You can decide, is this person, am I going to let him go or not? It's up to you. It's, you're the judge in that situation, right? Now, what if, what if let's say, the general had called at the beginning of the war. Let's say one of the generals called you at the beginning of the war and said, look, this, our leader, Hitler, he's a crazy guy. He wants to kill, kill a lot of people. I'm not on board with this. I want, I, I want to help you guys beat him. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to join your side and become a secret agent or whatever. I'm going to like, I, I don't want anything to do with Hitler. I want, to join your side what would you say then would you say okay well um you know let's um let's make a deal right uh we'll we'll, we'll, we'll let you join our side and um we'll forgive you of your sins um you know is that what you would say what would you say so if you're going into germany let's say you know in in 1945 how would you how would you judge the people there? Like, would you, would you just, would you just say, okay, now we won the war. It looks like we bombed them all. All we, we killed all their soldiers. We bombed them. So now we're just going to go back home and we're just going to forget about this. Was that what you would do? Like, think about it. Millions. So like, I don't know. They say like 50 million, I think, or more people died of the Allied, you know, in the germ. Basically, the German, the the German um, Empire, you know, in World War II, killed probably I don't know 50 to 100 million people. Okay, that's a lot of people. Think about that. The population of Canada isn't even that high. The population of Canada is, I think, about 40 million now. So it's just a, it's just incredible. Millions and millions and millions of people. Um, just dead uh, when they invaded the Soviet Union, for example, they just killed millions and millions of Russians, tens of millions. 
you know, what, what would we expect? What would we expect the Soviet Union to do? How would we expect the Russians to feel about that? Would they just say, okay, we won the war. Now we're just going to let everybody off the hook and, uh, you know, we're done. Or would they, or would they, w w if you were the general, would you just say, look, Germans, your empire killed millions of our people. So you're all dead. We're going to just wipe your empire off the face of the earth. Would that be right? Would you do that? Or would you try to find a middle ground? You'd say, okay, like, we're not going to forget about it. And we're not going to kill everybody. What we're going to do is we're going to set up like a court thing somewhere. And we're going to try to, we're going to try to figure out who was the most responsible for committing these evils. And so you set up a court, you get some judges and whatever. And that's what happened. That's what they did. They, they set up a court in Nuremberg called the Nuremberg Trials. The Nuremberg Trials, they were obviously in Nuremberg, the city of Nuremberg, Germany. And it was just the top people. They let everybody go. They let every all the normal Germans, they let them free. You know, you're done. You're, you're, you can... You can go and live a peaceful life. You, we're not going to put you in jail. We're not going to kill you. It was just some of them that were caught. Not even everybody who did bad things were, were, uh, were even, even caught. You know, when I, w I lived in Germany in 2014 and while I was there <laughs> in the German news, one day I saw they caught, they caught a 90 year old, or I think he was in his nineties a man who had been a prison guard at, uh, I think it was in Aus Auschwitz, you know, at the Auschwitz death camp in Poland. Um, so they, they, they had, they had kind of captured him, but they found him living in Germany. I think he was even living in my city where I was living. I can't remember exactly the details. <laughs> so they caught him and they were going to, they were going to, you know, go through the system of whatever, I don't know, put him in jail or whatever. <laughs> so it was funny because when I was living there, I started looking at all the old people differently. I, when I would walk around the streets, I'd kind of, when I'd see old people, I'd be like, huh, I wonder if that person, I wonder how many Jews that person killed. You know, I'd, I'd kind of be thinking about that, right? And, uh, yeah, it's crazy that there were real people still alive when I was living there in 2014 that were had not been caught who had been done who had done very bad things who had not been caught and so you know with these trials they just they just they just charged the most the most criminal of the group the generals the top generals uh, maybe a few of the really important people like the bankers or the people who were financing everything but I mean how would you let me know how would you judge that situation would you try to find everybody who voted for Hitler and to, to kill them or to put them in jail or whatever? What, would, what do you think the right answer would be in that situation? I mean, you can't just, what are you going to do? Kill like 80 million people. Like there's just, there were millions and millions of Germans, right? Living there. Some had, vo obviously a lot had voted for Hitler. Probably a lot didn't. A lot liked him. A lot didn't. You know, how would you judge that situation? Well, you know what? When Jesus comes back, when Jesus is the king, the difference is that he knows. He knows who is on his side and who isn't. Right? And so, <clears throat> guys, this is, there's a Jeep uh, 4x4 that keeps driving around. 4Runner, Toyota 4Runner. Keeps driving back and forth. What is it with all these people just going back and forth around here? I don't know. Maybe I should take another lap. What do you think? Should I go take another lap? But um, yeah, I just want to, I don't know. I just want to ask you how you would judge that situation in Germany. Um, and let me know in, your, in the comments what you think you would do. Because what it says in the Bible that when Jesus comes back, when he's king, um, you know, th there's, there's, it seems to me like there's only really 
two options. You're either going to be saved or you're going to be slaughtered. And uh, that's why it's important to to understand that the window, the window of time needs to like people need to take that opportunity while they have it because everybody in Germany had the opportunity to, to cross the lines if they if they wanted it right like even Hitler when Hitler was a kid or before Hitler started his stuff or even even after he came to power he could have called his he could have called Churchill or Roosevelt or Stalin he could have said look guys I know I've done some bad things here but uh, you know what let's not go to war let's make peace he could have done that he didn't right um, so you know if it's just an example that's, that's just I'm just using that as an example to say that there's a window of opportunity that people have to make peace don't wait for that window to close like you know with the cake example let's say the guy's eating cake and you realize your hero died because he ate so much cake well, you might die that day, that next day, because you ate so much cake. Maybe the window for you has already closed. Your body is shut down. Your arteries are clogged. Maybe you will die the very next day from a heart attack. Even if you realize, oh, yeah, I don't want to follow this guy anymore. It's going to hurt me, right? That's why it's important to recognize there's a window of time. And you can't say, oh, well maybe tomorrow or maybe next year if I see that I'm losing then maybe I'll switch sides like those German generals when they called they tried to get away there was no hope for them the window was already closed guys the they none of them you know they were all they were all uh, you know charged with all kinds of you know stuff and they were killed most of them were killed they they were they were executed why? Because their their window was over, right? Their window was up. But imagine like a normal German, or imagine let's say I don't know. Uh, what about let's think about uh, Hitler's doctor, right? What would you say? You catch now your the ger you know the the German government has fallen. Now you find his doctor, and you say, why didn't you kill Hitler when you had the chance? You could have poisoned him, killed him somehow. And uh, what if the doctor said, well, I was just following orders. I was just, I, you know, I'm just a doctor. I was just following orders. What would you say to that? Would you say, sorry, you, you knew what he was doing. Uh, you had the opportunity to kill him. You didn't. So now we are going to punish you. What do you think a suitable punishment would be? What about Hitler's personal chef? He could have poisoned him. He didn't right so what would you say to his personal chef or you know just different people right different people have different levels of responsibility for you know crimes right so how do you punish that you know when Jesus comes back and when he reigns as king from Jerusalem how is he how is all this going to play out I don't know you know I'm not the judge I'm not the judge he's the judge he will decide everything rightly. That's the thing. He will decide and he knows. But the, the, the important thing is to know that there's a window there, right? Because what we, say in the, what we see in the Bible is that he's going to slaughter people who don't want him to be king, who are his enemies, he's going to slaughter them. Now, what about, what about an average person who lives in a village somewhere over in some country? Or, or what, what's Jesus going to do with them? I don't know. I, I, I actually don't know. I mean, like, it seems to be the dividing line is those who those who have been forgiven by him for their sins and those who haven't. Right? Those who are under his blood, who have been covered by his blood, and those who haven't. Right? And so, like, remember in the story of the Exodus? Remember when um, <clears throat> when God basically sent all those plagues against Egypt and one of the plagues remember the last plague what was it it was the death of the firstborn so God just wiped out all the firstborn in Egypt and animals okay so Pharaoh's son died 
And then what happened? Who, who was it that killed them? It was, it was God who killed them all. Um, but for his people, he had told them in advance. He told Moses in advance what to do. He said, Moses, tell the people to kill a, you know, to, to kill a slaughter, a young, like a, a what is it? A, a lamb or a goat and put the blood on the doorpost of your house. And when I come by, when the death angel, right? The death angel comes by, the death angel will not touch anybody in that house when he sees the blood on the doorpost. So that's what happened. Death angel comes and is there, if there's blood on the doorpost of the, of the house, he didn't go in there. Didn't kill any, didn't kill the people, right? He didn't go knocking and say, are you a good person? Are you a good person? Are you a good person? No, he just was looking for the blood. He didn't evaluate the people inside. So that's the same way with Jesus. And that story was a foreshadow of the blood of Jesus. Okay. So a person can be a nice person, really, you know, you know, give, give a lot of money to charity and whatever. And do look, if they don't have the blood, if they don't have the blood, of Jesus over them and let's say a sinner a really bad person says God forgive me I'm a sinner you know <clears throat> wash me with your blood Jesus I'm I, I'm I'm I repent you are my king I join your side you know forgive me of my sins right that person will be forgiven but not the other person who was really nice and whatever without the blood right imagine like with the hit with the German with the German example the the, the Nuremberg trials Imagine at the trial, okay, you've got all the criminal, all the, all the enemy generals there, and you're one of the judges, the allied judges, right? And uh, imagine in the trial, one of the German generals stands up and says, wait, in my lifetime, I gave a million dollars to charity what would you say you'd probably say what does that have to do with anything right now then imagine another general stands up another general stands up and says wait when I was a kid I helped my grandma who was very sick and I helped her What does that have to do with anything? Another person stands up, says, wait. In my lifetime, I fasted for over a thousand days. Over a thousand days of my life, I didn't eat food or drink water. Or a thousand days in my life, I fasted. What does that have to do with anything? Another guy stands up, says, wait, 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 wait. I prayed 10 times a day for 30 years in my life. 30 years every day, I prayed 10 times a day. What does that have to do with anything? Right? All these generals standing up saying, oh, I did this, I did that. Doesn't have anything to do with anything. Why? Because they're on the wrong side. Right? This is what this, this is what, what is so important about Jesus. It doesn't matter how much money you've given to charity. It doesn't matter how many days you fasted. It doesn't matter how many, you know, how many grandmas you helped in your life. It doesn't matter how many times you prayed in your life. What matters is, because there's only one, your own good works can't get you to heaven. They can't buy you eternal life. There's only one person's blood, one person's life, that you, you basically need his life. You need a blood transplant, right? Imagine if you've got, if you're sick and your blood is full of, you know, cancer or whatever. You need a new blood. You need a blood transfusion from a healthy person, right? So that's what this is about. It's not about, uh, it's not about trying to get Jesus to like you. 
It's to say, I need your blood in me. I need new life. I need my sins to be forgiven. You know, cleanse me of my sins, wash me clean. You are my hero now. I was following other heroes before and uh, I recognize, now I've woken up, I recognize they're all gonna kill me. Only you are going to save me and you love me and you've done everything for me to have life with you forever. That's what it is. And then at that point, you know, at that point, you start growing and getting, um, you, you start, you start hating what you used to, what you used to, to do. You start, you start hating the empire that you used to be part of and you start training. You say, God, train me to be part of your empire. Train me to love you and to be, be part of the, you know, to be a human that you made, that you originally wanted us to be like, right? Um, <clears throat> You know, imagine if the German generals had really suddenly woke up and they recognized, man, Hitler was a really bad guy. Uh, I, I am so sorry for all my sins. Like I've done a lot of bad stuff. You know, this is just insane. I, 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 I realize this now. Well, is it, is, is, uh, you know, would they have had mercy on that person? Probably not. But would Jesus have mercy on a person who comes to them in real repentance? Repentance means changing your mind and being sorry for your sins and sorry for the things you've done. I'm sorry for following those useless heroes. You're my hero now. Um, will, will they be saved? Yeah, that's what Jesus says. This is why a lot of people don't like, a lot of people don't like him. They say, that's not fair. It's not right. God is looking for faith. There's a verse. Um, let's just pull out my phone here, guys. Romans chapter 10, verse, uh, verses 9 and 10. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's so important that you choose the right hero, right? So this is what it says. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved you will be saved it means all your sins will be forgiven and people don't like that because they want to hold your past sins against you right so you, oh you've done all that there's no hope for you anymore well you know like i said god's the judge and god is saying this if you confess with your mouth that jesus is lord right you say jesus you are my hero you're my lord you're the king. You're the rightful king. You're worthy to be king. Um, I'm so sorry for all my all the stuff I've done, my rebellion. You paid for it. You died so that I wouldn't have to die. You died so that I could so that I could have eternal life with you. That I could be loved and to live in your world. That's incredible. Please accept me, Jesus. Please save me and accept me. What do you think he's going to say? You know what I bet is like he's the judge, right? But if he's saying this, if you have some breath left in your mouth, if you have breath left in your lungs, if you're still breathing and living and you have a chance to do this, just do it. Guys, don't wait. Don't push that window and say, oh, if he comes, if Jesus comes back, then, well, I'll see if I follow him or not. Don't do that. I'm telling you, that's not going to be good. That's like uh, if you're in Germany and you're saying, oh, well, you know, if our empire loses, then maybe I'll join the side of the allies. That's not going to be. Jesus knows your heart. He knows who you are. He knows if you love him or you don't. He knows. And he said some very scary things. He said, many people will come to me and they'll say, Lord, Lord, we did all this good stuff for you. And and what is he he's going to say? I tell you the truth. I never knew you. I never knew you. Boy, that's scary. You know, it matters what God thinks of you, not what you think of God. Right? So that's why you need to pray. It's the way you should pray. God, you know, in David, in Psalm 139, 
David prayed a uh, very great prayer. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. He wanted eternal life. And so he said, know me, get to know me, search me, know me. Why? Because that's the important thing is if God knows you. Because if God knows you, then you're safe, right? If he loves you, he's going to say, he's, if he's going to save you, if he's going to declare you innocent, that's all that matters, right? Um, it doesn't, it, then, then nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how, how much you like, okay, let me think about like a, it, let's think of an example with a king. Okay. Like, let's say, um, take any, any famous person, any politician, it doesn't need to be king. I don't know. Think of anybody. Let's think about uh, who's your favorite sports. Who's your favorite athlete? Maybe uh, Messi or Ronaldo or David Beckham or any. Let's say you go to David Beckham's house, right? Let's say I would go to his house and I would knock on the door and say, hi, it's uh, Mark here. He would be like, who? I don't, I don't know you. What do you get? Get away from me, right? But imagine if he did know me, if I was his friend, then I say, Hey, it's Mark here. He'd say, Oh, come on in. Right. Come on in. <laughs> you know, I know you. Right. So imagine if the guards, like imagine at the, his, there's probably a gate in front of his house. Right. And I go tell the guards, I know David Beckham, let me in. Do you think the guards will let me in? Not a chance. They're not going to let me in because I say I know David Beckham. But imagine David Beckham comes out of his house and he tells the guards, Hey, open the gates. There's Mark. Let him in. The guards will say, yes, sir. We will let him in. Why? He's the, he's the boss, right? He's the owner. He's the master. He's the Lord. He's the king of that, of that area, right? Of his house. He can decide who he wants to let in, who he doesn't. So that's, that's what I mean when I say what, it's up to Jesus how he evaluates the situation. If, if, if he's going to let you in, it's up to him. It's not whether you did a lot of stuff or what you did for him, right? If you think, oh, I know Jesus. I'm Je Jesus is my best friend. I've done a lot of good stuff in my life. He's going to let me in. Well, let's see. Let's wait and see. And, but what this, what this book says, what, what uh, the Bible says is look, if you want to be saved, you need to, you need to choose the right hero. Like if you're following, what I mean is if you're following yourself, which is following Satan's plan for your life, if you're following yourself, uh, and you view yourself as your hero, Jesus is not going to allow you into his kingdom. Why would he? You're trusting yourself. You're trusting yourself. You, you love yourself. Your hero is yourself. You are looking to yourself to save you. It's you who should save yourself then, right? So imagine if Mark Zuckerberg, now he's building his safe shelter in the ground in Hawaii. What's Jesus going to say to him? Probably going to say to him, go hide in your own hole. Just save yourself, right? Why? Does Mark Zuckerberg trust Jesus for his, for his salvation? I don't think so. Uh, there's no evidence of that. So he's going to need to save himself. And if he can't save himself anymore, is he going to have a window of opportunity to say, now I'm, I can't save myself. Jesus, save me. It's up to Jesus. It's going to be, you know, it's like I said, what would you say when one of the German generals calls you on the phone? <laughs> Maybe it's too late already. Don't push the window of opportunity, guys. Jesus is salvation. Actually, that's what his name means. Guys, I think my battery's going to die soon. I might need to charge my uh, camera here. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening all this time. Uh, I know it's a long video, but um, do you know what the word Jesus means? The word Jesus actually means salvation. Okay, uh, I want to, it, so Jesus is the English word right? That's the English name. In his language, it was Yeshua. Yeshua. Okay. The word Yeshua actually has a meaning and that means salvation. Okay. I want to, I want to read you, um, 
<clears throat> a verse. Uh, it's, it was written about uh, 700 years before Jesus was born. Okay, so it's uh, from Isaiah chapter 12. Let me see if I can find it here. Isaiah chapter 12. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay. So listen to this. Listen to this in the English translation. I'll read it first in the normal English translation. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. Okay, now that word salvation is actually Yeshua. So let me read it again. And okay, you see, if, see how, how incredible it sounds, okay? Behold, God is my Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my Yeshua. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of Yeshua. Remember what Jesus said. He said, anybody who wants to live, come to me and drink living water. I will give you living water. Right? So, guys, for people who want to live forever, like I do, and what God, what God wants that too. Right? But God's not going to put up with his enemies much longer, guys. It's not going to happen. Um... So what do you do? You say, Jesus, you are the fountain of living water. I want you. Give me life. I need life from you. I can't, I'm not going to look for life from anywhere else. I've tried my whole life and now it's, I realize, now I realize, and I'm sorry, forgive me. You are my life. You are the only one who can give me life. You are king of the universe. You will be king from Jerusalem over the whole world. And I join your side now, not later. I'm not going to pick up the phone later like the German generals did. I'm doing it now. So forgive me. King Yeshua, you are my Yeshua. <laughs> You're my salvation, right? Be my Yeshua. Save me. Look, as long as you have breath in your lungs, guys, and you can move your lips and you can speak, there's hope. The window is still open, right? Like it says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, you're my Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is a guarantee. That is a promise from the Bible right there. Guys, I think my battery is almost, <laughs> almost going to die here. So I, I don't know. Let's see if I have any other notes that I wanted to say. I'll take a look through my notes and I'll charge my my camera and uh, but if I don't have anything else important to say I've been rambling enough here a long time but uh, so I'll wish you guys a happy Easter uh, love you guys so much and I uh, hope you're doing great but uh, look at my notes and I'll see if there's anything really important that I need to say yet otherwise I'll see you over in the next episode of Mad English TV take care all right, guys, one last lap here. I just want to uh, read you three more Bible verses. The first one is John 18, 38. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Think about that. Everybody on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus said that. Okay, here's another one. First John 3, 8. This is why the Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. That's interesting, to destroy the works of the devil. So that means if you join the kingdom of Jesus, you cannot keep doing the works of the devil. You know, God's patient with us, guys. That's great news. But you really, we, we can't do, we can't keep doing bad stuff. That's the problem. Um, but fortunately, he, he's patient. Um, Another one is, oh, just a, I was going to share this earlier, actually. It says, even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. So I love that verse, you know. There are people in this world who think they're strong and they can do everything and they can win and they can do everything. Guys, when Jesus is king, even the bravest warriors will flee naked when God, when God's wrath against the evil in this world 
comes down and it's coming soon like i said it's, i think it's coming very soon um but like right now right it's like nice weather people are at peace they're just living their lives they have a chance nobody's going to be strong enough to to fight and to you know they're not going to be able to kill him again he died the first time he gave his life um, for the forgiveness of sins but next time he's coming back as a king a conquering king to rule the world in love and that's good news it's not bad news it's bad news for the rich people who hide in the ground mm -hmm.